So it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Katrine Preller. Uh, she received her master's in neuropsychology from the University of Konstanz, Germany. Uh, for her PhD, she went to the University of Zurich, where she ran several studies investigating the neurobiological and social cognitive long-term effects of cocaine, MDMA, and heroin use. After completing her PhD, she joined the Neuropsychopharmacology and Brain Imaging Lab at the Psychiatric University Hospital Zurich and Hepter Research Center in Zurich, where she investigated the effects of psilocybin and LSD on self-perception, social cognition, and multimodal processing using different brain imaging techniques. After working as a postdoc at the Wellcome Trust Center for Neuroimaging in UCL and Yale University, she now continues her research on the neurobiological effects of psychedelics at the University of Zurich and Yale. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Katrine Preller. Um, thank you so much for this really nice introduction. Um, and of course, thanks a lot to the organizers of putting together this incredibly nice symposium. And um, additionally to that, I really would like to thank you as an audience for coming here and, um, well, listening to these talks and engaging with the researchers who are doing this work. So I have entered this field about 10 years ago, which compared to um, pioneers like Rick Doblin is obviously very recently. Um, and I was very lucky to be able to well, enter this field in Switzerland where we have this very long tradition of, um, of psychedelic research. Um, however, when I started doing this, I was told from quite a few people that while well, doing this will probably kill my academic career. Well, 10 years later, I'm still here and this field has, has grown so much and um, one of the reasons why it has grown so much is because you as an audience, as the general public, as other academics are really showing interest in this. So thank you so much for being here. Um, so the thing or the, the research I want to talk about is um, more psychedelic induced states, behavioral and neuroimaging studies in humans. So to make this, yeah, here we go. Um, so to make this a little bit more specific, the two, uh, the two psychedelic agents that I'm going to talk about are um, psilocybin and LSD. So psilocybin, I mean, we've heard from both quite a bit in already the recent talks. Um, psilocybin is the main active compound of the so-called magic mushrooms. And well, LSD, um, we've already talked about this. Um, LSD, both, um, both substances induce kind of similar psychedelic states. However, um, their neurobiology or, well, their neuropharmacology rather, is pretty different. So while psilocybin stimulates, in particular, the serotonin 2A and 1A receptor system, um, LSD stimulates quite a variety of serotonin and dopamine um, receptors. And this will become important for um, the studies we conducted with LSD. So in particular, um, Chris has already talked a lot about, about subjective effects. And I kind of want to spend two slides on talking about this again, because I think that um, the subjective effects are really important to eventually also understanding the potential therapeutic effects of these substances. So visual effects um, are, of course, the most well-known and they're the easiest to show to audiences. Um, so that's, of course, what I will start with. So what might happen under the influence of LSD or uh, psilocybin at the doses that we administer in the lab, um, it might happen that colors might start to appear much brighter. Things or colors might start to change completely. Um, things might start to get blurry. And the most common thing is that um, people perceive movement where there usually is none. Um, however, of course, these experiences, these visual alterations, are not the only, um, only interesting effects of psychedelics. Um, you have seen these pictures and this questionnaire in at least two talks by now. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick reminder of that. So it's not only about the visual um, effects, it's also about alterations in self-perception where we're talking about experience of unity, 
spiritual experiences, blissful states or insightfulness or disembodiment, um, that participants um, often uh, experience under the influence of, of psychedelics. This year is LSD, this one is um, psilocybin. Um, and some of them might turn out to be therapeutically beneficial. And talking about therapeutic, uh, therapeutic effects, there have been quite a few studies in recent years talking about, um, about the treatment of mainly mood disorders and addiction, but also OCD, for example, where these substances have been shown to produce very interesting and, and beneficial effects. So right now in Zurich, we're also conducting clinical research. However, this is not necessarily what I want to talk about today here, but rather I want to present the work that we have been doing with uh, healthy participants. And um, well, the reason why we're interested in working with healthy participants is, well, first of all, we think that um, psychedelics offer this unique opportunity to study um, clinically relevant phenomena like the ones we just talked about, for example, alterations in self-experience, that we can otherwise hardly study because they are very hard to induce. And the other reason is that by increasing the mechanistic and the pharmacological understanding of these substances, we hope to fully uncover their clinical potential. So there are two main questions that I want to address in this talk today. And the first is, well, what is the pharmacology and the neurobiology of psychedelic substances in humans, and what are the potential therapeutic effects of psychedelics. And so I'm kind of going back a tiny little bit um, to the pharmacology of LSD. I mentioned already on my first slide that LSD is targeting a variety of receptors in the brain. Um, so various serotonin as well as dopamine receptors. From the animal literature, we already knew that while well, the serotonin 2A receptor is potentially very important because this is a common ne mechanism that is shared by all serotonergic psychedelics. Um, but the animal literature also suggested that there might be a second phase of psychedelic effects induced by LSD that is modulated more by dopaminergic neurostimulation. Um, so before we conducted this study, the contribution of these different receptor systems in the human um, wasn't known at all. So we were particularly interested in finding out um, about the contribution of the serotonin 2A receptor, again, because it has been shown to be very important for the effects of psychedelics, of other psychedelics like, like psilocybin, for example. So what we did is we used a second substance, which is called cadenzarin. So cadenzarin is a more or less selective serotonin 2A receptor antagonist. Um, so when we administer cadenzarin, it blocks the serotonin 2A receptor. So we did that and then we waited for an hour and after that we gave people LSD. So then LSD was able to stimulate all the other receptors that it usually does, but it wasn't able to stimulate the serotonin 2A receptor anymore because this one was blocked by cadenzarin. So we basically, so this guy gave us the opportunity to, well, find out what exactly was left um, in terms of LSD effects when this one receptor was um, not, <coughs> not reached by LSD. And these are the first results. And those are, again, these are the subjectively experienced um, uh, effects of LSD in um, our, our healthy population. And what you can see here in, in pink is what LSD does. And um, actually, this is, not, not, uh, this is really not that interesting because what we can see here in pink is basically that LSD does what LSD is supposed to do. It isn't using an altered state of consciousness. Um, the next rather uninteresting part are the green bars down here. So this is placebo. And placebo is doing almost nothing, like basically what placebo is supposed to do again. Um, so the interesting part here really are the yellow bars because they are um, the condition where we first administered cadenzarin and then administered LST afterwards. And as you can see here, basically all subjective effects are blocked um, when we administer cadenzarin first. Participants could not distinguish between placebo and, um, and cadenzarin plus LST. 
um, meaning that basically all of the subjective induced effects at the dose we administered, which is 100 microgram, are dependent on the serotonin 2A receptor. And to address the question of, well, are there different phases, um, we obviously did not just ask them afterwards, but we had them fill out this questionnaire multiple times during, um, during the acute phase. And also here we see um, cadenserin blocks the effects from the beginning till the end. So moving on to, well, from subjective data to neuronal data, um, we, we had participants in the scanner um, and measured the bold signal there. And for analyzing these data, we took a slightly different approach than um, previously presented by Chris. Um, so we did not necessarily look at different networks here, but what we did here is we used an approach called global brain connectivity. And here we correlate the connectivity between each voxel and the rest of the brain. So these are functional connectivity data um, showing in blue decreased connectivity with this particular part of the brain with the rest of the brain. And in warm colors, we see increased connectivity of this area with the rest of the brain. And I think there are two important um, messages in this slide. And the first message is pretty obvious to I assume that many in the audience here have been trained in brain at in anatomy. And I think it is pretty striking if you see this pattern here, because we see this increased connectivity in particular in sensory and sensory motor regions like the occipital cortex here and here in the temporal cortex here, whereas um, the blue regions are really the ones who, which are associate with our associative networks. So um, the psychedelic state here, what we see is increased connectivity in areas that are responsible for processing sensory information, be it within our own body or with the outside world, and decreased connectivity in regions which are responsible for integrating this information. And I think that intuitively makes a lot of sense if we think about the subjective effects that um, me and the previous speakers have already described. So it is a state that is very sensory. So a lot of sensory information um, is being processed, um, be it from within or from, with, from um, the outside world. But the way we bring this information together and the way we integrate it is certainly very different from our regular consciousness. And um, I think this, this can also explain things like, well, why do we perceive the world and um, our own personalities as if they were new? Why do we attribute new meaning to things? And why psychedelics are able to break up rigorous thinking patterns that we see in many psychiatric diseases? Well, the, the answer to this question might be that we integrate this information that we receive from ourselves and the world in a different and in a new way. The second important information on this slide is again concerning the pharmacology, and this is basically what you can in, see in these bar graphs and in these graphs here. So again, green is placebo, uh, pink is LSD, um, yellow is cadenserin plus LSD, and what you can see here is that again, also on a neuronal level, no difference between cadenserin and LSD and placebo. So cadenserin does not only block the effects on a subjective level, but it also blocks the effects that we measure in our MR scans. Now, being researchers, we, we're always looking for confirmation for the things that we have found. So we added a second method um, to again look at whether the serotonin 2A receptor is indeed as important um, for the effects as we um, were hypothesizing. So we used a method that was developed in, at Yale University by John Murray and Josh Burt. Um, and what they did is they generated a cortical surface map of um, receptor gene expression. Um, and the receptor gene expression data came from the Allen Newman Brain Atlas, which is post-mortem brains, so samples of post-mortem brains about the receptor genes that are expressed within the cortex. They mapped this on the cortical surface which then gave us the opportunity to correlate the maps that they have created with our functional neuroimaging data. And 
the result of this is shown here. So this is our LSD map, um, uh, which I showed before, and this is the um, spatial uh, spatial localization of the serotonin 2A receptor gene expression. And if we correlate this, we see that those two are highly correlated and are much higher correlated than the other receptors that um, that LSD is stimulating. And in case you were wondering um, if this also translates to psilocybin, um, indeed it does, as you can see here. Um, it's so psilocybin, which is over here, and LSD induce a strikingly similar pattern um, in alterations and functional connectivity in the brain, um, which might give us an idea that um, this kind of differentiation between um, sensory networks and associated regions might be underlying the psychedelic state to a certain degree. The other thing that we looked at in our study with um, psilocybin is um, we investiga investigated time-dependent effects because um, many studies are measuring these effects, especially in the scanner, at different time points. And here we were particularly interested in what happens um, when a trip starts. And what we can see here is um, over here, this is 20 minutes after administration, 40 minutes and 70 minutes. And what you can see here is the first effects start to show up in the visual cortex, which pretty much aligns with what our participants tell us. So the first signs um, or the first things that they experience are usually that they start to see the floor moving, for example. And this nicely aligns with alterations in functional connectivity in visual areas. And then slowly but steadily, we see this pattern of differentiation between sensory networks and associated networks emerging over time until we reach um, the, peak, um, the peak effects here. Um, also, we were interested in why well, might there be something um, that is helpful in predicting how strongly people react to psychedelic substances. Because in other studies, it has been shown that um, well, the quality and the quantity of psychedelic effects correlates with uh, treatment success. So we were interested in, well, could we, could we predict this? And indeed, what you see here is a correlation between um, their placebo scan, so basically their baseline scan, with the magnitude in, of changes induced by psilocybin, also again emerging over time. So. Um, this could give us, um, so if, if this holds true also in a clinical population, we might be able to predict from their baseline scans how strongly they will react to um, psilocybin and therefore maybe give us a tool to um, already stratify patients um, for ones that will react strongly and ones that won't. Um, we then went on to test another model that has been proposed um, to underlie psychedelic effects. So it's called the thalamic filter model, and it has been proposed by um, Mark Geyer and Franz Vollenweider about 10 years ago. And based on animal studies, these two authors said that um, psychedelics act in a way that the ventral striatum loses its control over the thalamus, and the thalamus is usually regulating the information that reaches the cortex and therefore reaches consciousness. So they said that um, the thalamus is basically out of control and just sends a lot of information to the cortex which leads to sensory overload and the sensory overload is what it is experienced as um, the psychedelic state. And new, um, new fMRI methods or new fMRI analysis methods gave us the opportunity to actually test um, uh, this, these predictions of this model empirically. So what we did here is we used a method called spectral dynamic causal modeling that um, allows us to measure directed connectivity. So um, the one that I was talking before is just basically a correlation and tells us how strongly brain regions interact with each other. Um, but this method tells us um, actually which brain region is driving the activity in another region. Um, it has the disadvantage that at least for the time being, 
We cannot do this for the whole brain, but we have to be selective in the regions we look at. So therefore, we selected regions which have been shown to be, to be modulated by psychedelics and obviously also are key regions for um, the thalamic filter model. And these are the results. So first of all, in line with this proposed model, we see that the ventral stratum indeed shows decreased connectivity with the thalamus. And the thalamus indeed um, uh, has increased connectivity to the posterior cingulate cortex. And if you remember, it's come up in quite a few talks by now. Um, the PCC certainly is an area that is is, uh, has repeatedly been shown to be modulated by psychedelic substances. So all of this is in line with this model. However, we also found that the thalamus has decreased connectivity to the temporal cortex, um, meaning that it doesn't seem like the thalamus is just undifferentiately sending information to the cortex and leading to you know, just a sensory overload. Um, and I guess also that kind of makes intuitively sense because the psychedelic state usually is not necessarily chaotic, which a just complete sensory, overlay, or, uh, sensory overload would probably be. But it is, it has some kind of structure. Um, and therefore, um, even though mo many of the predictions of the model hold true, it rather seems that the thalamus is sending information to very specific areas of the cortex that by then, um, while well, integrating the information differently, is producing the psychedelic state. So um, this, I, I just want to briefly sum up this part of the presentation because this is the, the very short answers um, that I could give to the first question, what is the neurobiology and pharmacology of psychedelics? So we have seen that, the, uh, that um, LSD induced subjective as well as the neuronal effects are mainly dependent on the serotonin 2A receptor. We have seen that this increased integration in the sensory and somatomotor networks, and at the same time, this re reduced integration as, um, of associated regions may underlie the psychedelic state. We have seen that baseline connectivity may be a predictive marker of psilocybin-induced effects. Um, and we have seen that um, effective connectivity or directed connectivity changes induced by LSD are at least partially in line with the thalamic filter model. So this brings me to the second part of my talk. And um, the second part was concerning the question, well, which of these effects induced by um, psychedelics might really be therapeutically helpful? And um, I will focus on one specific, um, both one specific function that psychedelics are altering, um, and this is social cognition. And you may, um, Rick already um, talked a lot about social cognition and why this might be important in the context of psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, but I just briefly want to mention this again. So alterations in social cognition are core symptoms of many psychi uh, psychiatric disorders. And not only are they core symptoms, they are really influ influencing the development development progress and the treatment of psychiatric disorders because also the therapeutic process is a social one. Um, they comprise real world functioning. So if we think about a schizophrenia patient, for example, um, we are pretty much able to treat positive symptoms like hallucina hallucinations, for example. But if these people still kind of um, act socially awkward, they will have difficulties finding a job and keeping a job and while integrating into real world functioning again. And the main issue is that these, uh, these alterations in social behavior and cognition are insufficiently improved by current treatment approaches. And this is one of the things where I think um, psychedelics have a massive therapeutic potential. And um, the reason why I think this is uh, what I'm going to show you in just a few seconds. So, um, to give you a bit of background, we have mentioned this before, psychedelics reduce the processing of negative information. Um, mostly in the amygdala, um, we also see in this behaviorally, so a decreased processing of negative information. Now we were wondering, well, what happens to psychiatric patients? Um, usually they don't sit necessarily in front of computers and look at negative pictures, right? But what actually happens to, to them is social rejection. 
they get excluded from their um, social environment. Um, so we were wondering, well, is psilocybin affecting the reaction to negative social interaction, to social rejection? Um, so we had our participants um, playing a game in the scanner, and during this game, they were uh, they could throw a ball to either Michael or Sarah. They had been introdu introduced to both of them before they were administered the substance. Um, and what happened after a while is that Michael and Sarah stopped playing with our participant. So they excluded him from this game. And um, we are not the first to, to apply this paradigm, but quite contrary, this paradigm has been applied many, many times. And even though you know, it might not sound so terrible being excluded from you know, this game with two persons that you hardly know, it really reliably induces a feeling of being socially rejected. And it also reliably induces uh, activation in the anterior cingulate cortex. And when you do the same, uh, this, the same paradigm, the same game with psychiatric patients, like here, for example, borderline personality disorder patients, they show an increased reaction to um, the social exclusion. So what happens when we give them psilocybin? Well, first of all, we of course, again, we ask them, well, how, how did that feel to you? And we see that under psilocybin, um, they report a reduced feeling of being socially excluded. Now, of course, you might be, well, you know, they had psilocybin, so um, there's a lot, you know, there's, uh, there are so many things going on, so did they even realize they were excluded? Um, so, of course, we asked them many, many questions to control for this. For example, we asked them to guess how many um, ball throws they had received. And really, this was the only thing that was different from placebo. So they were completely aware that they were excluded. But um, emotionally, it wasn't just as terrible for them as in the placebo condition. And also, when we look at the brain activity, we see that exactly in this region, um, the anterior cingulate cortex, the social pain signal, is reduced. <clears throat> so we're a lab which is in general interested um, also in, in the pharmacology behind things. So what we did is we also did um, magnetic resonance spectroscopy in the same area here um, to see a, to, to investigate neurotransmitter and, and neurotransmitter concentrations in this brain area. And here we saw a um, pretty impressive correlation between the aspartate concentration in this brain region and this reduced um, bold signal in the anterior cingulate cortex, um, suggesting that maybe the aspartate sy system may be involved in modulating social cognitive functions. Um, so this brings me to almost the la last task um, that I want to present today. So Rick already mentioned empathy and how empathy might be terribly important in a therapeutic process. So we wanted to see whether um, psilocybin is able to modulate empathy. Empathy is a multifaceted construct, so we're talking about cognitive empathy, which means that um, a person is able to understand which emotional state another person is in without necessarily having to feel the same. Um, emotional empathy, on the other hand, means to actually feel with this other person. And we tested both. And what we saw here is that psilocybin indeed increased empathy, but only emotional empathy. empathy. So it increased how strongly our participants felt with other people. There were no differences in cognitive empathy, so they were not able to you know, better tell us what another person um, was feeling, but they were also not worse, which is good again, because that shows us that they were actually able to complete the task um, we had another task where, which was about moral decision making. Um, again, we did not find any effects on moral decision making, at least not acutely. So it doesn't seem like participants um, changed their moral behavior um, under the influence of, of psychedelics. However, both cognitive empathy as well as moral decision making might be something that you just cannot change acutely by, by um, a substance. But Maybe this is something that we need to check again um, post-acutely, maybe a week or a month after we had given them psilocybin. So 
to wrap it up, we have seen that psilocybin and LSD both modulate social cognitive functioning. We have seen that serotonin 2A and the aspartate system may be important targets for um, the effects of psychedelics as well as the development of novel medication. And um, the reduction in social pain processing as well as increases in empathy may be therapeutically relevant in the framework of a psychedelic assisted therapeutic approach. So um, thank you very much for, uh, for listening to this talk and of course thanks to all the people who have been involved in this research. Thank you very much, Katrine. Uh, questions from the audience? Again, please come to the microphone. Is it on? Hello? Okay, right, there we go. By what standard did you use to test um, moral, uh, like the morality seems very subjective as far as what's correct or what's not? Yes, um, absolutely. So we use the standardized moral, uh, moral decision-making task where um, it is usually, so they, it's, a, it's a moral dilemmas task really. So there really is no right or wrong, but you see that some people have a tendency um, in, in one or the other direction. And we didn't see any alterations in these tendencies in our task. Again, you know, it's a dilemmas task, so it's not like you are, you know, more, you, you're better or worse. Um, but, well, it wasn't able to modulate this. Um, but again, you know, th this certainly needs more uh, investigation. So there wasn't it. a standard, they just tested, the, they behaved the same way before and after? Yes. Okay, thank you. In regards to the catanserin, it, can that be given after LSD or psilocybin has been taken to, for possibly like a harm reduction? Uh, you know, uh, application? Yes. So, um, uh, so there is no scientific evidence that it can, um, but anecdotally, it seems like theoretically you could do that. Um, you would have to administer IV though, just because of the, you know, long dura duration until it starts acting. However, I really advise against this um, because I think it, there, there are many, there are many ways of how to deal with you know, a bad trip. Um, and a bad trip usually means that people are anxious. So um, if you know, none of the like talking to people, listening to music, if none of this helps, I'd rather give a benzodiazepine and let them have the experience of like living through the difficult experience, um, overcoming the difficult experience, and finishing the rest of the trip instead of just taking them out of a experience that might eventually be traumatic because they haven't been able to like experience how it goes away again. Great question. Great answer. Oh. That's when you know you're good, when you get applause. <laughs> Over here. Uh, yeah, hello. Um, I noticed that uh, today that most of the research that's been done has always been done on uh, what would be considered high level doses for the average individual. I was wondering if there had been any imaging research or even any studies conducted recently on a lower level, especially with the rise, the phenomenon with the rise of uh, microdosing amongst the public. Yes. So um, there are two, uh, two rigorous scientific studies which are, you know, really based on empirical data published on um, low doses of, of LSD. Um, so both of them are, well, subjective effects mainly and, and psychological tests. So both of them are, they are out there. Um, they are published already. Um, you can look, look them up. The, well, to summarize the results really briefly is not much is happening. Um, we will publish a study hopefully very soon um, about fMRI effects. Um, where, so I think the, the only thing I can mention by now is, well, there are changes in the brain which are interesting. Yes. So, um, but right now, so all of these, well, there is very little research out there. Um, 
And, but from the things that are published right now, my summary or my takeaway would be, well, it doesn't necessarily seem like low doses of LSD are a creative or cognitive enhancer. Um, there might be therapeutically interesting effects in there. So um, when we're talking about healthy participants, maybe not so much, but in a clinical population, things might be very different. Um, and also the studies that are published right now, they're not, um, they're not investigating a regular dosing regime, but they're just you know, administering once and then scanning. So things might again be different if you, exactly. that there was like a decrease in negative like social perceptions um, I just was wondering your kind of uh, story or explanation about about bad trips about people perceiving um, anxieties or perceiving negative attitudes in others when they're when it isn't there because many people have a self-report of increased anxieties or increased negative stimulus yeah I'm, I'm not entirely sure if I understood a hundred percent but so you, you're asking about um, well, where, where do the bad trips come from? Where is this increased anxiety coming from? Is it like you were saying that there was experimental evidence that there's you know, decrease in social anxieties, mm -hmm. but uh, many anecdotal ex you know, experiences have people have increased anxieties. Mm -hmm. What's the story there? Yes, so um, again, you know, as it has been mentioned before, the, um, the effects can vary a lot from you know, a very well, safe environment that we are trying to create for our participants and um, an environment which is uncontrolled, like taking LSD at a festival. And so from what I've seen um, and heard from our participants is that usually these an this, this anxiety that you know, people describe as a bad trip is not necessarily coming from paranoid ideas, at least not at the doses we administer. Um, so they're not, certainly, they're not seeing anyone else being bad or something but most of the people are just very anxious that they lose control. Um, and that is usually where, where anxiety starts. Like, I'm losing control about you know, what I'm doing here, I'm losing control about well, the time, I'm, uh, will this ever going to stop? Um, so, so it's not about you, know, you suddenly see someone you know, being, being vicious or whatever. So it's really more about I'm anxious because I, I kind of I, I don't know what's, what's going on or I don't, um, I'm, I'm not feeling in control anymore. Um, and that is something that we try to handle um, and we're very, well, I'd say very successful in handling this in a controlled environment. Thank you. Over here. In terms of consciousness, I was wondering about if your group had looked at the uh, dorsal anterior insula, which is often linked to consciousness and like how that connects, how it's affected by LSD or other psycho psychedelics and the link to other brain regions and the connectivity pathways. Mm -hmm. so, um, so this is super interesting because we've always been, so in all the analysis we've done, we've always been looking for the anterior insula and unfortunately it, it really never showed up too much in, in our analysis. Um, but also I think the way, so maybe we should change a little bit of how we think about certain brain regions because usually there's no, no one brain region which does this and that because um, it's always about the interaction between different brain regions. And um, we, again, we haven't necessarily found a huge involvement of the anterior insula um, in our paradigms. Maybe we, if we used others that might be very different. Um, or maybe it's just we haven't used the right analysis method right now where you know, we really were able to catch or capture the involvement of the anterior insula. But right now I can't present any, um, any evidence that the anterior insula is involved. John. Great talk, thanks for your time. Um, so uh, the, the interesting data to me was your genetic modeling um, for the additional receptors that Contanserin has shown to have affinity for. So to your knowledge, have there been any studies that have investigated pre-administration of those compounds? And if so, to what degree did they depress the subjective effects of the drug? Um, so are the compounds then cadenserin? Sorry, would you mind repeating this? Yeah, so I guess at the heart of the question is just 5-HT2A antagonism versus some of the other receptors that uh, came up on your screen 
So what degree does antagonism at those receptors decrease the subjective effects? Yeah. So unfortunately, we don't really know. Um, so this was the first blocking study in LSD in humans that was ever conducted. And um, I'm pretty sure that the other receptors that are targeted by LSD do have a functional role and they probably modulate the experience. Um, but we need to find out about this by specifically blocking them. And so far, no one has done that. Um, so the only thing that we can say right now is, well, it, it, the serotonin 2A receptor needs to be there, it needs to be simulated. Um, if, if that isn't the case, then basically nothing happens. But again, that doesn't mean that the other receptors have no functional role, but they need the serotonin 2A receptor. Katrine, thank you so very much. Thanks.